This is what no politician talks about when they talk health care and health insurance. And if you notice, nobody's yet said how much it's going to cost the taxpayer. For this week's Chef Talk, we're going to unpack and really dive into what's wrong with health care today. We all know that something is wrong with our health care system. Fixing health care costs and talking about how we can improve our health insurance is part of essentially every single standard political stump speech. So what are they not actually talking about? How can we prevent chronic disease from happening in the first place? Let me use an analogy to talk about the unspoken issue really at the core of the healthcare debate today. So let's imagine that we're all on this boat and this boat is America. We realize that there are holes in our ship. There's these leaks. And these holes are just created by passengers on this ship, not knowing any better, just punching holes into this boat. Because we can't be all sinking on this boat, we're investing a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of smart brains to try to fix these holes. So you have these hole fixers whose professional job is to be trained to fix these holes. You have different companies and entrepreneurs making better patches. You also have business people financial engineers figuring out different kind of schemes to pay for these hole fixers. These are kind of like insurance systems. So you have different kind of subsidized group insurance systems trying to figure out how to best pay for these hole fixing. And then you have different people doing the actual fixing of the holes. And then you have the different materials that are used to fix these holes. How does this analogy fit with our healthcare system today? Well, the hole fixers are different types of doctors and nurses. These are people at the front line fixing the holes that are created in our boat. And what are the people that are making these patches? Well, these could be thought of as medical device developers or pharmaceutical developers. These are building different tools to fix these holes. And of course, figuring out how to pay for this, that's our health insurance company. But in this whole system and how politicians today are talking about it, is that they're talking about the insurance system or how we pay for everything. Or we're talking about capping costs of drug prices. But what no one is talking about is that no one is talking about why people are punching holes into our boat. I think all of us can agree that there's something needs to be changed, but all we're talking about is kind of the patch, but we're never talking about the root cause. The root cause is just a really difficult problem. And that problem is that we've given up agency and responsibility of our own health. So what's wrong with politicians today? Well, they're focused on what to do after the hole is made. We're focused on making that hole fixing cheaper. We're figuring out how to get people paid when they're fixing that hole. But the hard question is, how can we prevent chronic disease from happening in the first place? And that's a really difficult question that's probably a non-starter in politics because it puts the blame on you and me. It puts the blame on our individual selves. And why is that challenging? Living healthy isn't really convenient. I know what it's like to want to just hit a button on my food delivery app, get a pizza, get a soda, turn on my Netflix, not sleep until it's 2 a.m., and then wake up and not really feel like exercising, and then going on this terrible, terrible cycle. We're not eating well, we're not exercising, we're not living well. And that sets up the perfect firestorm of metabolic disaster. We've talked in our program, in our podcast, on how the standard American diet really is essentially engineered to give us diabetes. We've talked about how our modern lifestyles have made us very sedentary. So why don't politicians talk about before these holes are created, before chronic disease sets in? I think we're just in a culture today where it's easier to blame the system or blame the institutions for creating a construct or environment that gives us poor health. But I don't think we should be passive like that. I think there are definitely environments that causes poor health outcomes, but it's not 100% of everything. We definitely have agency to drive health in our own health and take a little bit of that responsibility in ourselves to make ourselves healthier every single day. But we're in a culture that doesn't really wanna hear that. It's so much easier to talk about fixing the system. It's not personal. It's about some monolithic big corporate thing or this big government thing, this big bureaucracy that we can nudge and poke and it's so complicated that it's not personal anymore. But it is very personal when it's your decision, it's my decision of how to live every single day. That's a culture that I wanna talk about. That's a community, a movement, an idea that I wanna plant 
within our population today. Facts. One third of Americans are pre-diabetic and diabetic. The majority of us are overweight and obese. And these trends are increasing. One of the most astounding facts that I heard from the U.S. Army Surgeon General at a conference I went to last year suggested that almost half of our young children that are military recruitment age can't even pass the fitness standards to even get into the military. Literally half our population is so unfit they can't pass basic fitness tests. There's different threats from foreign powers or different terrorist organizations, but Nothing is as threatening to our own safety and our own economy and our own nation than the fact that we're all slowly killing ourselves. When I think about what's preventing America from being a better version of itself, well, it's really our, our sick population, our sick citizens that are constraining our capacity to be better, richer, more successful as a country. So that's why I care about this problem. It's astounding how quickly we deteriorate as physical people when we're not thoughtful about our nutrition, not thoughtful about our lifestyle. One metaphor that I've really been pondering about, the concept of the zoo. We've all been to the zoo and it's a really fun environment to see lions, see elephants, see the rhinoceros. I think it was some of the funnest memories that I had growing up. But in recent years, I've had the opportunity to really see these animals in the wild, be on a safari in Tanzania, trekking around the Bornean jungle, seeing lions, wildebeest, zebras, monkeys, actually in their natural environment. And, and, and realizing these two different perceptions of these animals is really jarring. I, I think now looking back on when I go to the zoo, you see these animals lounging, lazing around, not really moving, not really active. They don't need to be hunting. They don't need to be surviving. They get dumped their food every day on the hour, every set rhythm. They get to get annoyed by little screaming children. I don't need to be an animal expert to really just realize that these animals are basically depressed. They're in caged boxes and they don't have anything to do. And this might be an extreme analogy, but I feel like modern civilization has put humans in a zoo. Let me explain. We put ourselves in boxes. Our home is a box and our office is a box. We move back and forth within that box. We have the convenience of food, oftentimes delivered by an app or in our pantry, processed foods, shelf-stable, maximized and engineered for you to eat more and more of it. Am I advocating that we get rid of the zoo, we get rid of technology, we get rid of society, we go back to being cavemen? No, that's unrealistic, that's not practical. Hell, I like my modern convenience, and I know you do too. There's some things that have been done right that we have seven, almost eight billion of us on this planet now. And I think that's generally a good thing, but there's trade-offs on that. Civilization has allowed us to really expand the number of us, but it's not clear that the individual one of us is healthier, is happier. So what should we do about that? Let's go into three practical ways that we can take agency and responsibility of our own health into our own hands and affect change from the bottom up. Let's stop punching holes into our own deck. Let's stop our people around us from punching holes into the ship and eventually we'll make our ship really, really strong and cruising in a direction that we all really want to go in. The first thing is education. And credit to you if you're listening, you're already on that track. You're spending your hard-earned time learning and trying to expand your perspective and knowledge of this world. I think we should really be thankful for the internet and different technologies that decentralize information. I remember when I was in elementary school and I was just learning what my dad did during his physics PhD program at UCLA and kind of following him on campus and visiting the old labs and his old libraries. And zooming back in those days, you couldn't just look up research papers. You couldn't just see the scientific literature. You have to go to a specialized library check out the actual journal articles, or even in these things called microfishes, what you basically were scans that were shrunk down into a little projection slide that you have to check out and then blow up on a screen. And that's to say that it's actually quite hard 
to self-educate 30, 40 years ago because the published data was holed away into the ivory tower of academia or in some specialized library. But today, you and I essentially have the same access to the same published literature of any academic library. If you're doing a PhD at the top university in the world, or you're just someone on the computer, on their laptop, trying to understand metabolic syndrome, you literally have the same access to the same published data. You can even reach out by email or call these researchers and talk to them or even tweet at them or reach out to them on social media. I think the access to the information and the people doing the cutting edge research has made it much more universal and much more accessible for us to empower ourselves with knowledge. Science is not about an appeal to authority. Science is not about listening to who is the most charismatic or who has the best story. That's all noise. Science is the process of generating hypotheses and using experiments and data to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Nothing more, nothing less. That's the scientific method. You and I and every single person can use a scientific method to learn and understand the surroundings and the environment and our bodies around us. I think the decentralization of information and the decentralizing of different tools like continuous glucose monitors, like blood finger readers for ketones or glucose, or different wearables to track our sleep, to track our performance, to track our heart rate variability, are all giving us power to understand and do experiments on ourselves. My point is not to say, do this, don't eat that, exercise more, exercise less. My point one is educate yourself because you're in a lucky world, in a lucky state of the universe where you literally have the finger at your fingertips the whole corpus of human knowledge. So that leads into point two. Implement it and bring people along with the community. Actually connect with like-minded people that share interests in health, share interests in nutrition. It's very hard to do any one of these things by ourselves. But when you have a community and friends of people that are interested in improving their metabolic health, improving their metabolic flexibility, trying different diets, trying keto, trying carnivore, trying vegan, whatever diet you want to try, that makes it so much more fun. The point of science is not just to find truth, but to also share that truth and share that knowledge with other people. The HVMN team has been lucky to help start some of these communities. You can find a group of folks that are very interested in intermittent fasting, keto, at WeFast, a Facebook group and a Slack channel. There's also a group of us on this YouTube channel who write in and send us questions and send us ideas. It's always fun to engage with all of you guys and post pictures and chat about health. Part of being in that community is that you can't just talk to talk anymore. You got peer pressure to actually walk that walk. That's where I found most inspiring to meet and connect with a lot of you, where you guys are pushing me to be a better athlete. You guys are pushing me to experiment more with different biohacking experiments. Getting that accountability of being in a group and, and, and showing numbers and kind of teasing each other, that's what keeps it fun. That's what keeps it sustainable. The third thing that I suggest that we think about is focusing our attention and our money towards companies and ideas that we think are the right path. I recently posted a meme where there were two overweight women taking two liter bottles of Coca-Cola, pounding it into their face with a pizza the size of literally your dining room table. And at the bottom it said, this is why I don't want to pay for your health care. How can you help someone who doesn't know to help themselves? And I think that's where steps one and two come into play. We have to educate ourselves to bring the people that we care about with us. And then three, that gives us more of a platform and more of an opinion to really start thinking about where we want to put our money, where we want to put our attention. Clearly, taking a two-liter bottle of Coke to the face is not good for their obesity. There's no debate about that. So my idea is spend your attention with brands or thought leaders or podcasts. Spend your money not on the Coca-Colas of the world, but on products that try to make 
foods and products that are more healthy. Hopefully, as our money and our attention goes to more healthful products, more healthful ideas, more healthful foods, the system of capitalism will follow along. How can you and I, having this conversation, improve ourselves? And use our own selves as a role model to change the immediate community around us. Look, there's social economic issues where people can't afford this stuff, or they're just not educated enough to understand how to choose what foods to eat. There are food deserts, especially in the South, where there's no availability of fresh foods. There's no availability of nothing, something that's not a package, scientifically engineered to make you metabolically deranged foods there. I understand that it is a really hard problem to solve, but that's where I think the education is really important. One idea: What if we put warning labels on soda? This is highly concentrated, virtually toxic levels of sugar inside a very convenient, very delicious, very almost addictive form factor. If we realize that smoking is killing millions of us or thousands of us through lung cancer. And we buy the argument that overconsumption of refined sugar is creating diabetes and killing millions of us. Is it not fair to say maybe we need to have a smarter way to label products so people that aren't as educated as, as you or me on their nutrition choices have a more of a support system to get them more educated? We also have a precedent of taxing things that are vices. Again, cigarettes are pretty damn expensive because we tax them. A recent Berkeley study showed that the taxation of sugary drinks have also led to reduced consumption of these sugary products. Not necessarily trying to be political here, saying we need more regulation, we need more taxes. I think there's some nuances there, but I think these types of questions, these kinds of policy debates, are almost more important than different healthcare insurance schemes or different Medicare for all. All these kind of things, I think, are. After the fact of chronic disease, they're absolutely important, and we should talk about them. But we also need to talk about what we do before the chronic disease happens in the first place. The healthier that each individual one of us is, the more prosperous, the more healthy our society is, and that's the virtuous cycle that I want to help create. We've inadvertently put ourselves in perhaps the zoo of modern civilization, and we should realize that. Let's take the best parts. Of civilization, the convenience, the safety, the accessibility to information and goods. But let's also think about maybe removing and escaping the bad parts of it. Being thoughtful about taking the best of both worlds. Now, let me know your thoughts. I always appreciate if you give a like and a subscribe and a thumbs up. Leave a comment below if you agree with what I'm saying, or you want me to dive in and unpack more of these ideas further. Always appreciate your thoughts. Appreciate your support. I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.